Welcome to the Property Buyer Podcast, where we explore the world of residential and commercial real estate to help you make better decisions about buying, selling, or investing in all types of property. Join me, Rich Harvey, CEO of propertybuyer.com.au and multi-award winning buyer's advocate. Our podcast features expert interviews, market trends and insights, and practical tips for navigating the complex world of Australian real estate. Whether you're a home buyer, a seasoned property investor, commercial buyer, developer, or simply curious about the property market, our podcast is for you. Join us as we share our knowledge, strategies, and experience and help you achieve your property goals. Well, welcome to our next edition of the Property Buyer Podcast. We often hear about people who've been successful in building up a substantial property portfolio, and we often dream about being in that position ourselves. We think to ourselves, how did they get there and what tactics did they use? Is it really achievable to get a portfolio given that property prices are getting higher every day and the banks are still really tight with lending standards? We dream about how it would be to take the pressure off having to work every day, having less stress and a life without money worries. We might think about the satisfaction of having assets that grow while you sleep and being in a position to help your kids and be generous with others or be philanthropic with your money. Well, today you're in for a treat. I'm about to interview a highly successful property investor who's built a substantial portfolio and freely shares his knowledge and experience. Jeremy Inazelli is a founding partner of KHI Accounting Group. Now using a combination of investment strategies and tax effective structures, Jeremy has a passion for helping investors acquire and hold more wealth and helping them well into retirement. Jeremy, great to have you on the podcast today, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Rich. Absolute pleasure as always, mate. Now, um, Jeremy, we have a little strange tradition and we like to ask our guests um, a thought of the week. And this week it's from Johan Wolfgang van Gogh, who says, whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power and magic in it. What do you take from that quote? Um, it's a it's a great quote that talks about not just dreaming but turning your dreams into a reality. So taking action. Uh, we've got a motto, and, and one of the partners in our office and the best friend of mine, Manzul, always talks about dr- dreaming it, believe it, and then acting it. Mm. Um, it's all well and good to have the the great plan in your mind, but you've got to find a way to execute it. And it even starts with just a little thing, um, like. How to eat an elephant, Rich? And the answer is always one bite at a time. One bite at a time. Yeah, execute it. I love it. I think you sound like an action orientated man. It sounds like that's a bit of a culture in your business, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We always live always live by the motto that to achieve greatness, you need to stop seeking permission and take an action. Yeah. Um, so for all of our colleagues, you know, we always say be bold. Mm. Be bold and be daring and, and don't be afraid to ask that question because without it, you or other people won't be able to learn. You won't be able to take a step forward. Mm, brilliant. No, that's fantastic. Well, Jeremy, can I take you back to, uh, to where it all started? How did you actually get started with property investment? And, and I guess what was your key motivations to get going in property? So I was very fortunate to obviously start in, in accounting as a professional career at an early age. So, you know, the age of 18, 19. And I was lucky enough to deal with a lot of high net wealth individuals at the time, people who were investing in property. Um, when interest rates were much different when they were today, Rich, back then 8 9% was a normal interest rate in the <laughs> yep. uh, mid-2000s. Yeah. But, but seeing these people really starting to create wealth and, and managing their money and, and buying property, and at that stage property was at relatively good prices, although back then you always say that it was out of reach. So for me, seeing these people actually do it was enough motivation for me to start learning about it. Mm. And then having lots of chats, I was a bit of a seminar junkie at that stage being a young kid i went to i was going to two seminars every week uh, one yep. during the week days and one on the weekend and i was just learning and absorbing as much as i could more so from people's stories uh, i've always been a big fan of war stories mm. more scars you have you know the more, more element that you get uh, relating to what they've done and how they've gone through it and the battle scars that they've they've received at the end of it and to me that gave me a lot of life lessons from there mm journey as opposed to learning myself. So motivation came from seeing people actually doing it rather than just reading about it. Mm. And then that sparked the interest, which which led into now nearly 17 years of, of, of property investment journey. Fantastic. Well, it's often been said that we learn more from our mistakes or from others' mistakes than we do from our own successes. Because I think 
you know, a lot of successful people, unfortunately, have a, a great deal of hubris about them and, uh, you know, self-promotion. But I think it's really important to stay humble. And, uh, and just like your philosophy, I think you're there to help other people achieve their goals. It's wonderful. So, yeah, well, talking of mistakes, um, tell me about some of the biggest mistakes that you might have made and, and perhaps what you learned from them. See, I'm, I'm going straight oh, there, mate. I'm right. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's good. And I share this all the time with a lot of yeah. people. Look, being a, a younger a younger man with no grey hair at the time and a little bit of experience, or I thought I had a lot, but really back then, looking back with hindsight, there was no experience. Mm. For me, Rich, I built my my portfolio, my idea of a great portfolio on the number of properties that I had, as opposed to the quality of the properties that I had. It was always about the quantity. Mm. And I was buying crap. I was buying cheap property at the time um, just for the sake of getting a number. I wanted mm. to get to 10 and I wanted to have the quickest way to get to 10 properties was to buy cheap and crap. Mm. And uh, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the, you know, ugly duckling in a good area. It wasn't a good valued property. It was just anything I could get my hands on uh, that was cheap and I could borrow. So I learned quite quickly that when I was buying these very regional properties or, you know, very subpar townhouses at the time, um, the number was what I was aiming for, not the quality, and therefore I got bitten quite a bit. When did the um, when did the penny drop for you that you needed to shift your focus from quantity to quality in your portfolio? So, so the repair. So uh, being an accountant, I always like to look at percentages and ratios. Yeah. And when you're buying a hundred twenty thousand dollar property and a new roof needs to be put on it, which costs the same amount as a new roof on a $500,000 property, <laughs> all of a sudden my repairs and maintenance or my potential renovations at the time was adding up to 20 to 30% of the property's cost price. Wow. Um, mm. Now, again, a new hot water system on a $100,000 property at 2500 that's 2.5% of the property's price just in a hot water system. Yeah. New kitchen, new bathroom, new roof, all of a sudden I've just bought the property again. Um, so for me, that was a, a, a penny dropping moment to say, what have I done? I'm buying these really cheap, poor quality properties, significant issues in them. I'm buying them for the number, but adding up all this amount of cost of repairs, uh, rental arrears, because a lot of the areas were struggling in terms of tenants. And I was starting to lose a lot of money just holding these things for the longer term. Mm. And even if I was to make money from a capital growth perspective, I worked out that on the trajectory I was, the growth I needed to achieve from these properties on a per annum basis exceeded 10%. And, you know, we, we all aim for that 7 to 10% growth in the property market. And if I'm spending 7 to 10% of the property's value in repairs, I'm not really moving forward. No. Uh, so that was a bit of a pivot point in my portfolio mm -hmm. years on. And I started to really clean up and sell off a lot of those properties and, and move into better quality properties where there was an X factor attached to it. And that was probably the biggest lesson that I learned was Jeremy, Property investing isn't just about a number of properties. It's also about the quality of mm. properties that you're purchasing as well. It's interesting. I mean, there's often a lot of debate on forums about, you know, how many properties do you need to retire? And I say that's the wrong question. You know, it's what total value of properties do you need to retire? And even more to the point, what's the total of value of equity and cash flow that you're going to get from your portfolio? Because you could have a $10 million portfolio tomorrow, have $9.5 million worth of debt, you know, you're not going to retire anytime soon, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it can it can really, but I'm fascinated by your ratio of repairs. That's a really good point. Just then on that mistake question, is there any other mistakes that you commonly see other people make, not necessarily yourself, but, you know, being an accountant, you would see a lot of numbers going through your books, but classic mistakes that you see other investors make trying to build portfolios. Yeah, so it, we all, one of the big things I always see is the position of the property as a forecast. So lots of buyers agents, uh, they do it themselves as well. So generally people, clients will be buying a property with a 20% deposit or a 10% deposit, and they're expecting the balance to come in from the bank. It could be a 90% loan or an 80% loan. They're not factoring in the cost of that deposit. For most investors out there, uh, Rich, a lot of people are borrowing for the deposit using equity from another property. Mm. So when they're doing their cash flow forecast and they're not adding that 20 or 25%, which is costs and deposit, it's actually putting the false narrative in their mind that the property is in a different position. Yeah. And when it comes to the end of the financial year and I'm going through their actual property portfolio and saying, hey, guys, your negative gearing from a cash perspective mm. is X amount. What did you feel it would be? And they're saying much lower. And then we work mm. through the deposit and costs and all of a sudden they're out of pocket an extra 10 or 15 grand, which, which in most cases is a lot of money for many people to, to sink. 
So the big thing is, is the forecast of numbers, people not knowing their numbers of the existing portfolio. For me, I reconcile my portfolio across all my 23 properties on a monthly basis because I treat my properties like a business. Mm. And that business is so important because the ins and outs really drive the next purchases I'm making. People don't generally treat their properties like a business. They wait till the end of the year to see what the outcome is. And I think that's probably a very poor decision because you really need to be active with how your portfolio has been managed and the numbers on a month by month basis. So you know where to tighten the belt or where, where you can start to push forward with other properties mm. uh, or other types mm. of assets. So I think people not knowing their numbers is where I see the biggest mistake. Mm. And then that doesn't give you the plan to move forward. Mm, excellent points. So just think about someone who's you know seen the title of this podcast, how to build a $7 million portfolio from scratch. What, what's your advice for someone just starting out or pretty early on in their investment journey where they might not have an investment property yet or maybe just one or two but really want to get a substantial portfolio? What, what's your advice for them and how can they get going? So understanding the end game of what you're trying to achieve is important and manufacturing the calculation backwards. So for many people, I'll ask the question, what type of level of passive income would you like to say that you've achieved what you've achieved? And then from there, they say, well, I might want $100,000. We gross it up to include expenses. And that means they're going to need about a $2.5 million portfolio, roughly fully paid off to get their hundred grand after expense income. Yep. Then what I really do is I say, guys, you then need to sit down with a mortgage broker and share that vision with them. Because if your peak borrowing capacity is only $1 million or one5 and you need to buy $2.5 million worth of property, how are we going to fill that gap? So the lending strategy is so important. I probably pay more emphasis to the lending strategy early on in your portfolio. So you're getting it right and utilizing your professionals as a journeyman as opposed to a transaction. And I think that's the biggest key because a lot of people start planning when they hit a roadblock and the plan should be done at the very start and, and just implementing it. One of the biggest things is don't become too too paralyzed by, by analyzing numbers. I feel there's so many forums out there now <laughs> and and so many different media publications and my, my, my social media rich is filled with, with mm. so many people's different opinions on how to get to the same outcome. I sometimes feel that you've got to really find your own path mm. and your own path comes from the knowledge that you gain with the professionals around you so you can achieve what you're after. And mm. that's done at the start, not done when the roadblock occurs. Yeah, I love that. I really like that. Understand the end. Exactly what, you know, one of my mentors who I've never met is Stephen Covey, who said, you know, begin with the end in mind. You know, so if your end goal is literally, you know, 200K worth of passive income, you know, you're going to need to be pretty close to $5 million worth of unencumbered property to, to deliver that. And, uh, and you're absolutely right, getting the right advice around the team, so the right accountant, the right buyer's agent, and particularly the right mortgage broker who's investment savvy is absolutely critical. Um, and then considering what kind of strategy, like you say, there's no one size fits all. And a lot of people get hung up about picking a strategy. And uh, at the end of the day, there's multiple strategies that can get you to this point. But some people agonize over them for years. Meanwhile, the market's moved up 10 or 20%, you know? Just pick one you know, and go with Absolutely. it. Like, you know, some people get that analysis paralysis disease and just can't move forward, you know. Um, look, talking about picking um, both both a, a, an investment property and a, and a, and a strategy, what, what sort of investment criteria do you recommend when, when selecting a property strategy? So there's different stages in your investment journey, Rich. You've got someone who's quite novice, someone who is, is a little bit more advanced, and then someone who's willing to take a little bit more risk. With the knowledge that they've developed and now i'm probably in that third stage that pivot stage of my investment career for me now a lot of the properties that i'm choosing are very much x factor i don't necessarily buy something where i can't manufacture my own level of equity or my own level of rental income um, but for people that are starting in the portfolio journey you need to be looking at your really good cookie cutter properties that are going to have low maintenance give you that really good taste and flavor into the investment journey uh, if you're having a property that you, so many people I know have bought one or two properties and stopped because they've just had a terrible experience, whether it's a off the plan home that's riddled with issues or took six to 12 months longer than they initially anticipated. Uh, it could be a really old home where they had a DIY disaster, um, or it could be a unit, for instance, that was sitting in a very saturated market. Um, so you've just got to pick something that's relatively stable, 
not going to absolutely win races on one side, but mm. not on the other side, not going to lose you anything either. A really mm. good taste and a flavour into something that's really important. You know, you gradually build your palate up to something quite spicy, Rich, as my father says, <laughs> uh, before you Love dip it. straight into the jalapeno yeah. or the regions, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. for, for anyone starting, that's what you really yeah. need to be looking at, something very yeah. stable. I think of another analogy. It's a bit like an athlete or, or when you're younger, you've got to learn to walk before you run. You know, I mean, you're at a stage now where you can do quite advanced type of strategies and investments and a lot of people buying their second property. Okay, well, let's do a development site. You know, we see these developers apparently making a mot. So let's go and, you know, spend a few million dollars not knowing all the pitfalls and all the risks. So I think it's really important to even think about commercial property. Um, I always say to my clients, get a couple of resi properties under your belt before you think about getting a commercial just because of the risk of vacancy. Um, so there's yeah different strategies, but learning to learning the basics, learning the ropes before you really dive into some more sophisticated strategies, I think is important. Absolutely. Tell me um, more about your thinking here. I want to delve into your mind about how you decide where to invest. Is that an important thing to you about your location? Yeah, absolutely. So location for me is very important. Now, one of the first criteria that I look at when I'm choosing an area is how easy it is to get things through council. Uh, so I'll go to my own backyard, if I may. I'm in the, the Liverpool LGA. Um, and from a Liverpool perspective, the wait times at the moment in council are anywhere between nine to 18 months. Mm. So for me, where my strategy is adding value through building additional dwellings and duplexes and triplexes and other things, for me, it's a long time from the time that I buy the property to the time that I actually get the property out of VA or council. Um, and that to me is cost. There's a mm. significant amount of holding costs and opportunity costs attached to it. So for me, I'm looking for friendly councils, councils that are pro my strategy. Um, and then I then start to look at the macro or micro factors. I'm looking at the population. I'm looking at the jobs. I'm also looking at just the areas, gentrification in general. You know, a lot of Sydney, for example, Rich, has gentrified substantially uh, over the last 20 years. And what was a bad area now is a million dollar area. Mm. Um, and, and that natural gentrification is occurring everywhere. We look at it, Queensland, especially in the Logan area, where it was considered a a quite a mm. low socio-demographic area. And now mm. you can't pick up anything less than 500,000 there. Yep. So the areas are changing. Areas will, will gentrify as everyone's income start to increase. So that's another micro and macro factor that I'm looking at in a particular area. And then I'm looking at the last thing. I'm looking at, well, who's going to be utilising or buying the property that I'm going to be creating? Um, so for me, what type of market am I aiming for? Am I aiming for the Airbnb holiday stay market? Am I aiming for the long-term rentals? I'm trying to produce an asset that someone wants and someone wants to pay a lot for it. So, you know, if I'm looking at the northern beaches, for instance, or even in a in a west or eastern suburbs, I'm not going to be putting laminex bench tops and $2 mm -hmm. PC items yep. into the property. I'm going to be spending mm -hmm. premium money to provide a premium quality asset. So yep. it's, it's just like anything in business. Again, my approach to treating properties like a business is important because I want to provide something to somebody that they're willing to pay more than what the real value is. Mm, um, so that to me is important. Mm, no, excellent points there. We really appreciate you tuning in to the Property Buyer Podcast and I hope that you're finding our expert interviews helpful. So that we can keep providing this information and growing our audience, we rely on word of mouth recommendations. If you found this information useful, could I please ask you to share this podcast with your friends, family and colleagues and ask them to subscribe to the Property Buyer Podcast. It would be a big help and we'd be very grateful for your support. Thanks once again for sharing the links. And now let's get back to the podcast. Now, I guess on a similar vein to sort of talking about where to invest, what, what are the best types of properties that you like to invest in? You, you talk about, you know, picking the right area. How do you decide what type of, like thinking back to maps, even your earlier stages in your you know, property buying career, what sort of properties did you decide to buy? And were they apartments? Were they houses, townhouses? What's going to yeah, work for someone who's building it up? So er earlier on, it was a mix of houses and townhouses, Rich. Um, and I found that as, again, I evolved, I wanted more X factor. I wanted to get my fingers. I wanted to use my brain as much as I could to create and generate value. I just didn't want to have my, my property sitting there for a longer period of time waiting for the market to do its thing. Um, so for me, moving forward, buying the townhouses and then selling them later on, 
I focused on properties where there just was a little bit of X factor and it could have been just as little as a renovation or a granny flat to something a lot larger where it could have been a duplex site or a subdividable block of land. So for me, having that little bit of sugar on top that can sweeten the deal and change the numbers in your favour, that's what I aim for now. And I encourage clients wherever possible, you know, after, you, after you've built up a couple of properties that are very foundational in nature, that are the pillar of your whole portfolio that you can lean back onto for equity, then you can start to move into smaller X factor properties. And again, it could be as little as a renovation or adding a fourth bedroom or changing the layout of a home to add value um, to a granny flat or to something much larger. So for me, what type of properties am I investing in is things that I can add value. And even to this day, I'm not afraid to buy a property where it could be just a small renovation for hopefully an ideally good markup in terms of a value from an equity position or a resale position. Mm, excellent. Really love that approach, Jeremy. That's great. Um, what, what's been maybe one of the best investments you've ever made? What sort of returns did you get from that sort of, uh, that sort of investment? Um, so there's, been, there, there's probably been a couple that stand out, um, you know, buying in greenfield areas. Um, I, I did some research into greenfield areas and it's not something that I typically invest into a lot, but, but knowing this particular area quite well and knowing the pipeline um, of infrastructure works that were coming in, I decided to buy a block of land and all up the overall cost was about 900 grand to build the duplex in the land. Um, and then two years later, sold the whole thing for nearly $2 million each. Mm. So that that's one that did really well, um, more than doubled my money in the space of was two that, years. And, was that also a market timing thing? Do you think you were lucky or you just you think you just bought really well at the time? Oh, absolutely market timing. Absolutely lucky. Absolutely lucky. The market did the market did very well, but I was able to pull the trigger at that right time. When I started yeah. seeing, you know, a hundred people turning up to an open home, to me that's just a huge amount of of insanity in terms of the price. And that's the type of market that I want to be selling in. And for me it was the opportunity then to move that money and to push it into two deals. Mm -hmm. Now those two deals didn't do as good as the first one on its own. But those two deals combined produce the same results as one. So you're not going to have every single deal making a stupid amount of money. Um, if you get it, it's brilliant, but you've got to have your parameters of your min and max. And once your property hits a, a maximum threshold that you're happy to take, sometimes it's worth pulling the trigger. Um, you know, the greed gets involved and that property did, did drop, believe it or not, did drop during the banking roll commission. And that property would have came back about 30% in its entirety before coming back up to its peak and maybe surpassing it. So if I held on to it today, I probably would have gained a couple hundred thousand dollars additional profit. But I look at the five years that I would have had to wait to gain back that couple hundred grand. For me, I've done so much more with that money in yep. the interim. Got it. Yeah, fantastic. Wow, some great tips there so far. Um, you mentioned earlier you, you've got 23 properties. Do you mind me asking what, what's the sort of total value of your portfolio if you're happy to share? And, and, yeah. and secondly, how did you manage to finance so many of these properties over time? So financing, it's always been a tricky thing for me. So as my income's grown in my profession, that has helped. The right structuring has helped me quite a bit as well. A lot of the properties that I'm holding, I've held for some period of time and I've been able to you know, buy property, add value and sell half of it or sell the rear property. Um, and that's been giving me an opportunity then to pay down debt, extract equity and then move forward in a different structure. So for me, a lot of my properties are held in eight different trusts. Um, so that's been brilliant. I've got a mixture of commercial and residential as well, um, just to help with the cash flow because some of my residential properties at any stage might be losing some money and that's then filtered in and factored in by the commercial properties that are making me money. So I'm utilizing properties to kind of pigeon pair and offset each other. So at any one point in time, I'm not having to take money out of my back pocket and uh, move forward uh, with more properties in mind, better properties in mind. Mm. And I'm not afraid to pull the trigger and sell. You know, in the last in the last maybe three years, Rich, I've probably sold now close to 15 properties mm. and bought back 10. So mm. for me, I'm always happy to pivot. I'm always happy yep. to sell, realize mm. my profit, unfortunately pay the capital gain tax, which I hate mm. paying, <laughs> but then utilize that money to buy a much bigger asset. So the, the denominator for me is one of the most important things in my portfolio. Mm. I want to grow that denominator as large as I possibly can in a very sustainable way, because that means that very small percentage movements 
result in very large gross gains. Mm. Um, do you, so do I, you have a do you have a target in mind or where you want to get to your denominator? Yeah. So the, the goal for me is that I, you know initially when I set out I said I wanted ten million dollars worth of property, and then I pushed that to twenty million dollars worth of property, and then now it currently sits my goal is thirty million dollars worth of property. So mm. not far away, but um, mm. for me now I'd love to say well let's push it to fifty million dollars worth of property, mm. but it's not going to come from buying your standard you know homes on, on a 600 square meter block of land now for me i need to look at much larger things so i'm building my denominator by going back into some of the initial properties that i land banked very early on and um, putting units on so at the moment i'm doing the construction for 10 units in wa um, mm -hmm. and when that's completed i'll be doing 10 units in the campbelltown basin so mm. that's that's going to be my goal now. I'm not necessarily going to have to buy mm. more properties to do it. I'm just going to have to build on my portfolio and create more properties. Fantastic. I'm just going to unpack a few things there because you just gave some fantastic advice in the last two minutes that I want my listeners to really understand. So, you know, when I asked you, how did you finance so many properties? So firstly, you said your income increased. So that's one tip I say to people, keep improving your skills, keep improving what value you have as a person because you can't just always close the door on the boss and go property investing. You need a, you need a regular income in order to be able to service your, your properties. Secondly, you said holding your property. Some people are too quick to pull the trigger. Uh, but secondly, thirdly, you also said you trade some and that's great. You're recycling your equity into a bigger and better opportunity. And I think that's the a key thing there is that if you look at what you've got in your portfolio and you go, you know what, I can refinance this property, pay down a bit of debt here, but I know I'm going to get a much greater return by buying this other property here that's got development potential, for example, than doing that. You also said um, you've got a mix of res and commercial, and that really helps you to cash flow your whole portfolio. Um, and I think maybe that's another question for you. We see a lot of investors get stuck on just buying one investment property. How can the average investor achieve multiple properties over time? How can they can they get that cash flow to sustain buying multiple properties, do you think? Yeah, so you've got to look outside the box. You've got to think at the real value of your property and what the market wants. Um, so is it a short, is it really good short-term rental property? Potentially it might be a really good long-term rental property. What is the market willing to pay for? And then you provide that to the market. Uh, and the other thing I'm seeing quite regularly now, and I adopt this in my own portfolio, is the use of the right structure, Rich. Mm. If you can get the properties into the right structure, there are some banks which do favour um, the way that some investment properties act with inside certain structures like trusts. And long term, if you can get these particular assets into a position where they are, be able you know, to be serviced on their own two feet from the rental income that it generates, some banks will look at it quite favourably to negate the debt and then continue to move on forward. So there are, there are significant advantages understanding the finance spectrum. And that's where it's probably been my key takeaway. I've learned so much about the finance space and how to finance property, looking at very successful investors all around the world. Uh, the art is not sometimes necessarily just buying the property. Mm. It's, no, it's learning how to finance the deal. Yep. Um, and any developer will tell you out there that 90% of their pain point is not building nor selling, it's financing. Mm. Mm. So if you can understand that model very early on and how to work with the biggest stakeholder that you'll ever work with in your life being the banks, then that's an important process to learn, identify and then execute so you can adopt that in your own portfolio. Yeah, fantastic. Really good advice. And just, just again on that, how does the, the average buyer get going? What, what are some of the tricks that you've learned that you could share with our audience in, in getting finance for property investing? I mean, is it, is it just a matter of paying off your credit card every month? Is it, is it just a matter of having a clean record? Are there any other kind of key tricks that you'd say that, that help people to get finance and, and get into the market? Yeah, so planning accordingly of your windows of opportunity becomes very important. If you know that you've got a window of opportunity, your income is absolutely fantastic because you've worked three jobs consecutively for the last year, then you've got to make the best possible outcome that you can with inside that time frame. Because sometimes it's not sustainable, especially anybody in business, Rich. If you've had an absolute cracking year in your business, that is the time where you've got a really great window of opportunity to be able to go forth and buy more properties, knowing full well that you might have a slowdown to come in the years, ahead of you, or it could be some significant uh, investment that you need to make in your own business. So I looked at, like to work with my clients and say, what have you got planned for the next one or two years with your money or with your job? 
um, with your family. Family becomes very important. One of the biggest uh, inhabitors that I see people unfortunately lose on is when they're planning for families but not really speaking to their broker about it. Yeah. You know, if you're planning to have a family in the next couple of years and you've got this brilliant income between you and your partner, that's sometimes the best time to go hard if you can budget accordingly, of course, because once a family comes and your partner has to take time off work, that does diminish your borrowing capacity. So being very aware about your borrowing capacity and what looks what the world looks like for you in two years ahead is important because that's where you start your planning, you execute on your plans, and then you might go through a bit of a consolidation phase. Circumstances change after that, and then you open up your window of buying opportunity again. Yeah, excellent point. I think borrowing capacity um, is is super important. I always say to people, your borrowing capacity is like gold. It's it's the goose that lays the golden egg every year, and treat that accordingly. And it's you've got to use it or lose it, as you've said. If you're in a small business or you're a business owner, as you say, some years will be better than others. And if you've got capacity, go to your broker, get a pre-approval, and start investing. And uh, I think a lot of people. I guess, are put off by the amount of paperwork you've got to do, the amount of documents you've got to pull together, and that's just you know part of the pain process. You've got to do it. Um, but often then they'll get the approval and then go, oh, honestly, searching for properties is so hard, and they put it off. You know, they don't think about using a buyer's agent to kind of help them progress the process. So I think it's really important to, um, as you say, plan ahead for people planning kids or, or one of the partners maybe not working. Yeah, plan that into the, 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 uh, the long-term plan. Um, I want to ask you a question, which is often a tricky one. You remember Paul Clitheroe, uh, the old financial planner, used to sort of recommend paying off your home before you start investing was kind of his, his, uh, his method. But lots of homeowners these days have got stacks of equity in their home, but they're afraid to use it. What's your view on you know, paying down a home loan first before investing? And what would you advise? If, if you've got an abundance of money and nothing to do with it, then I, no one ever went broke paying down debt. Um, but once you really understand what money is and how economies and, and RBAs and, and or reserve banks and governments value money, you see that it's just a piece of paper and it gets withered, it gets withered away, it's buying power with inflation every year. So I learned very early on that, and it was a, a lesson my father told me, he said, Jeremy, if you have $200,000 debt today and you only pay interest for the next 10 years, what will that debt be in 10 years? And I'm there with a calculator trying to do all these really sophisticated calculations. And I looked up at him and I said, Dad, the debt would be only 200 grand. He said, that's correct. Mm. He said, but what would that property's value, what would that rent be in 10 years' time? And then again, I'm trying to do all these sophisticated calculations. And I said, probably double. He said, that's the lesson you need to learn. He said that if you can use yesterday's money and invest that in tomorrow's assets, you multiply that by obviously a significant amount of time. You learn very quickly that money, the value gets withered away every year through inflation. Mm. And there's no joke. There's no, um, there's no hidden secret. It's not a joke out there. The RBA tells you that every almost 19 to 20 years, they want the whole economy to double. Because if their target is 3%, 2 to 3% inflation, if you add that up, compounding 3% each year, Roughly, I think by memory, and you're an economist, Rich, you'll know this yeah. as well. I think it's about 19 to 20 years or maybe slightly more, 21 years. Yeah, but every right. 21 years, the the, gov mm. the RBA is wanting the economy to double. Mm. So mm. If, your mark, if your money is in the market uh, for at least 21 years, we expect it to double, but your debt won't. Your mm. debt won't. So if you can get as much debt as you can hold comfortably, budgeted for, and have that in the market for at least minimum 21 years, we expect it to double. And once I kind of got an understanding of how, how money and how fractional lending works and, and the mechanisms behind it, I learned very quickly that having my money paying down debt and not being invested in assets, once that debt's paid off, your, your property is moving in the market, but you already had that property already. Mm, so that's... what will my value and what will my money look like in 10 years if my debt stays exactly the same? So for me, mm. I, I know and understand now how money works and what governments around the world are wanting money to do. And that's every year have less ability to continue to purchase more goods. And that, that fall brings, therefore brings inflation. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I'll do it on another podcast, but I've actually analyzed some stats uh, the other day, looking back over the past 25 years and um, the average median, uh, average growth rate, I should say, for Sydney and Melbourne has been roughly seven and a half percent per annum over the last 25 years. And if you take Sydney's median house price of, um, yeah, say approximately $1.5 million, 
in 25 years time, Jeremy, guess what the median house price will be in Sydney? Yeah, no idea, it'll, Rich. It'll be $7.9 million. <laughs> okay. So that's just mathematics for you. Simple as that. And people are going, what the hell? Uh, in 20 years time, it'll be about five and a half million. But even, even jumping from 20 to 25 years, it goes from five and a half to 7.9. It's just dramatic. The, the rate of compound growth. I mean, Albert Einstein said it was one of the seventh wonders of the world. Um, you know, and that's the thing about being in the market. And the longer people put off building a portfolio, the more behind the money they're going to be. So um, I've got another one for you, um, putting your accountant's hat on. What, if you had a million dollars in equity today, what would you do with it in today's market? And let's assume you don't have a big portfolio. I just want you to go back to being a, a sort of a more beginner investor here for our audience. What, what would you do with that money, do you think? So $1 million today, if I had it in today's market right now, mm -hmm. I, I, I'll be a little bit against the grain on this to many mm -hmm. you know, property enthusiasts and property advocates out there, but I actually feel the best market to be in if you can afford the negative cash flow, very important as a disclaimer, the negative cash flow, mm -hmm. Uh, would be the Victorian market. Um, a lot of my understanding at the moment is when I'm looking through a number of properties is it's very near its pre-COVID value. Um, it just didn't have the bull run that a lot of the other states mm. did during the COVID mm. pandemic because yep. it actually had a negative population growth. Exactly. Um, and it is changing. We've, we've I've just heard on the radio uh, the other day that 316,000 migrants came into the country settling between Victoria and New South Wales. Yeah. And now Victoria's population is starting to show positive growth um, numbers and figures, which means mm -hmm. that there's going to be a little bit more stretch and a little bit more pressure yeah. being put onto yeah. the Victorian housing market. So for me, mm -hmm. if you can afford the negative cash flow, the big disclaimer, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I think for me right now, $1 million would would be very suited in the Victorian market, especially in those inner rings around the city. So Jeremy, we didn't talk before we had this podcast and you have amazing ASP, but I would 100% give you a gold star for that comment because I was actually just talking to a group of bankers earlier today and they were asking me, you know, I showed them all of the, the stats for the last 12 months and, and which markets have grown and, you know, Perth's done 18% and Sydney's done 10.5%, uh, Brisbane's done 12.5%, et cetera. And I was saying, and then Melbourne has done a, a little measly 4%. And I'm saying, have a look at this opportunity right here. So picking the future winners doesn't mean picking the highest percentage growth in the previous years. It actually, exactly as you said, there's a thing called a reversion to mean. And there's also key drivers in different markets. And I totally agree with you that I think Melbourne is an underrated capital city for capital growth, um, but it's not getting the yield. And that's the issue you've got for a lot of investors. And Yes, the Victorian government's imposed a slightly higher land tax. I mean, it's marginal. It's not the end of the world. But um, if you can afford the negative gearing, I do think agree 100%. Melbourne is great for longer term capital growth. You know, um, I've got another question for you. Uh, as an accountant, what are some of the, the sort of best tax tips that you could share with us that, that they could in, implement in their uh, in building a portfolio? Is there any kind of key key tax things that we need to watch in building a portfolio? Yeah, so it changes from time to time. So depending which market you're in and interest rates at the time and how your property portfolio is performing, my I like to tailor um, you know people's situations quite differently. But a couple of the key things that I'm working with at the moment with many clients is while cash flow is a little bit of a struggle at the moment with these higher than COVID rates, I, I always believe the rate at the moment, while we do, it is high, it's not the highest I've seen mm. as an investor my first property I purchased, there was an eight in front of my interest rate and that was cheap mm. at the time. Um, but at the moment, the rates are high, high, much higher compared to what we've seen in the last couple of years. So PYG variations are very prevalent at the moment and mm. that's giving people the opportunity, again, the value of money today. It's giving mm. people an opportunity rather than waiting at the end of the year to receive a refund, they're getting that refund through a reduced amount of tax that their employer has to withhold. So PYG variation is a great way to get your tax refund throughout the year as opposed to the end, giving you greater cash flow to be able to hold your property during the tougher times. Mm. Timing of expenses is very important as well, Rich. Uh, a lot of people will wait until July and August to do some of those repairs, and that means you're waiting another full year to receive the level of tax benefits. So if you know mm. that there's some expenses in your property portfolio from a repairs and maintenance perspective that you need to do now, do it before 30 June. Mm. Time versus value of money, um, getting that refund back as soon as you can from the money you spent is important. Mm. A couple other things, if you've got opportunity in your property portfolio where you can improve the position, don't wait. 
a lot of people, oh, I can do a granny flat on this property, I'll do it in 10 years. I've seen many clients with great granny flat property, port, uh, great granny flat properties who have waited 10 years to build one. And if they built one at day dot, they would have spent 70 grand on a two bedroom granny flat, returning at that stage 250 a week. Mm-hmm. Today, that same granny flat would cost you 200,000 and it's returning exactly. 500 a week. Exactly. So for me, again, it comes back to inflation of cost. Mm. We know things are always going to get expensive. So, and your rent will probably be the same for a five-year-old granny flat as a new granny flat, typically. Mm. So mm. if you've got an opportunity to improve the cash flow position of your portfolio, don't wait. Because mm. um, yeah. during the GFC, one of the biggest things that I saw was land bankers go bust because mm. they all waited for this golden opportunity to bring you know, their land to the market. And mm. when interest rates went up during the GFC and lending became strictly uh, much tighter, much stricter, these people went bust. But mm. if they did the development at the time that they acquired the land, say in the early 2000s, they probably would have made their money and walked out with a significant amount of cash. So if you've got an mm. opportunity to do something, you do it straight mm. away. Yeah. Probably not a tax tip, um, but more so a cash flow tip. The other mm, thing that's... is diversify. The other thing is diversifying into the right structure. Um, lots of clients they look at a property's position today where it might be negative and geared, but they're not treating the property with a business plan attached to it. So again, if you've got a great business plan attached to your property and you know that in two or three years' time you can get this very positively geared, think about what that property's position would be in for the next fifteen years, not the first three. Because mm. if you can have that property in the right structure, there are substantial ways to minimise tax. Um, long term, not just looking at the short term benefit today. The last thing I'll mention is understanding your superannuation. Mm. So many clients I have to educate on what super actually really is. How does mm. it work and the things you can do with it? People just leave their super to the side and it really becomes active when they're about mid 50s. I think sometimes that's too late to nurture your super. It's got to start at an early time because one of the best ways to get the best bang for buck in terms of tax minimization is additional superannuation contributions if you've got the capacity to do it. The Mm. government's got some great incentives, such as the five-year carried forward superannuation concessional rule, which is a great way to top up your super. And again, with the ability at a certain level of money that you've got to leverage and buy property in the self-managed super fund, that's a great way long-term that you can turbocharge your portfolio utilising your super in a substantially better tax environment, 10% Mm. tax rate, on yep. properties or assets being held longer than 12 months with a one third discount, 15% tax rate on earnings and up to about $1.7, $1.8 million of superannuation cap, tax-free mm. income at retirement. Mm. So mm. you can eat your cake and eat it too. You can have the candle burning at both ends, which is only gonna benefit you moving forward. Mm. So they're probably the biggest tax tips or, or things from an accountant that I would recommend. No, fantastic. Um, I guess part of the, this topic is around how to build a, a, a portfolio. And I guess the key question here is how many properties or what value of properties does someone need to retire? How, how would you answer that Cause question, Jeremy? Um, look, everything will be adjusted for inflation. And people think, but if I try to work towards 100 grand today, you know, 100 grand in 20 years is not going to help me. Inflation will, will bring that number up. But You know, that number has changed and every time I read more publications, it seems like it's getting larger. But I would probably say, um, you know, when you're near retirement, I think 100 grand in today's money is probably more than enough to retire quite comfortably, depending on your expenses, of course, which would be meaning you need about a two and a half million dollar portfolio returning about 5% in gross income to achieve that. And that takes into account expenses, 20% shading Uh, and inflation will help that help bring that number up. People Mm. tend to forget, Rich, that when we get older and having older grandparents now, we don't need a lot of sustenance. We don't need a lot to enjoy our life. We can't, Mm. you know, my my grandfather recently passed passed away, God bless his soul. But Mm. I remember when I first bought a sports car, I was a Mustang at that stage many, many years ago. Mm. Um, He was in his early 80s then and the poor bugger couldn't get in in and out of the car. (laughs) So the chances are you don't need a Ferrari in your retirement because your walker won't fit in the front seat. So I think it's understanding what retirement looks like for you is quite important. And that what if you get a Tesla? What what if you get a Tesla truck with a special lift for the wheelchair, mate? Then you can. (laughs) Mate, with the cost of electricity these days, I don't know if people can afford to fill those things up with the electricity. Um, But but I think that's important. Knowing what your retirement will look like or want want it to look like. 
is mm. important. Start the way you want to finish and have that mm. end in mind. And you'll find that your number that you need is not as much as you think. Okay. Um, a lot of people yeah. set their goals too high, mate. They're on a 150 grand income and they want to retire on $400,000 a year. Yeah. Yeah. You're not spending that much money under today's circumstances. So the chances are you won't need that, but it's good need. to strive for it. Yeah. It's definitely good to strive for it, but it may be just a little bit, a little bit out of your reach. Got it. Got it. And is it is there an age where I guess property investing stops making sense? Like for people in their fifties and sixties, is, is it sort of make sense for them to think about building a portfolio, or have they left it too late? No, no one's left it too late. Um, there, there's never an age to stop investing, investing in property or investing in whatever you wish to, but it comes back down to what you want from your investments. Um, typically speaking, and very openly, I see a lot of people pivot away from property in their later stages of life, mostly residential, to cash in on their capital growth. And they've yep. done with the headaches, they've done with having to fix kitchens. And then they pivot maybe into a little bit more of a cash flow investment, which has got low maintenance. Mm. So you, you, your goal is, is between now and retirement, you've got to get as much growth as you can. Because while you're still working, you probably don't need passive income as much because your job is is helping you, you know, put the food on the table. But once that golden goose is gone, which is your job where you've got this reoccurring cash flow, then you've got to pick and choose the right assets that are performing. So mm. I'll give you a great example, Rich. I've just got a, a client who we worked with over the last couple of years. He had a $30 million unencumbered property portfolio, no debt, mm. 30 million. The net income mm. that he was receiving from this portfolio was about 250,000 a year. Why so low? land tax the new south wales oh, wow. state government was making more money from his property portfolio than he was wow. a lot of his a lot of his properties were in that five million dollar bracket yeah. um worth five mil but the rent was only fifteen hundred dollars a week yeah. you know bringing these mm. bringing these back onto a net yield the net yield on some of these properties were only around about one to two percent yeah now mm. he's happy with his growth he doesn't need his balance sheet to be any bigger what yeah. he's after now is a much stronger p l yeah. So with a, with a couple of great financial strategists, we worked with selling down his portfolio, only about $10 million worth, mm. uh, paid the capital gain tax, which was in you know just a, above $1.5 million at that time. And we moved his $8.5 million net balance into various different other assets, very mm. high cash flow assets. Mm. And his P&L today looks closer to about $700,000 a year as yeah. opposed to about two hundred and fifty. dollars So mm. the pivot mm. needs to happen. Um, simply holding properties for your entire life will get mm. you maybe where you want to be, but you need to always analyze your investment on valuation mm. basis, not just cost mm. basis. Because mm. some of these properties that he had on yield on cost was 20%, mm. um, which mm. is which is brilliant. But yield on value, in some circumstances, it would have been better for him just to sell the property and put the money in the bank. Yeah, um, yeah. Again, but that's at a different time where he's not really factored, worried or factoring in the balance sheet movements. Mm. Yeah. He, he wants a P&L position now. Got it. Fantastic. Well, it all points to getting professional advice around uh, at the various stages of your life. You know, don't try and do it alone. I think it's a key message here. And Jeremy, you've given us some wonderful advice here. Can I just uh, pick your brain one last time and ask you to share perhaps the best piece of investment advice that you've ever heard? Money goes down, properties go up. That's mm -hmm. the best investment advice I've ever heard. <laughs> Money goes down in value and properties mm. go up. Um, mm. I don't think that's a blanket call for every property, of course, but uh, I think it just goes to show that, you know, if you're having lots of cash being saved up or, you know, like the Italians out there who store it in the backyard in many of the holes that they've dug or under the pillows or mattresses, your buying power of that money reduces year on year. So mm. having it in assets at least gives you the opportunity to move with inflation and having it in great assets gives it the opportunity to far exceed inflation. So in an environment that we're in at the moment, which is inflation is the buzzword rich, money goes mm. down in value mm. and assets go up. Mm. Absolutely. Wonderful. Look, Jeremy Inazella, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, they can get you at KH, KHI Partners. Is that correct? That's it. KHIPartners.com.au. Hit the uh, yep. contact page and we'll, I'm sure we'll get back to you very soon. Wonderful. Well, look, thank you again so much for sharing such great advice. And uh, yeah, I just want to really encourage our listeners to that have heard the, uh, the message today that, uh, that building a portfolio uh, takes effort. 
It takes skill. Um, there's lots of different parts to it, but don't be afraid of setting out on that journey to build it. You can do it. And uh, many of people have trod the path and been successful, had some war stories along the way, uh, but definitely build a team around you. And uh, if we can help you, a property buyer, in picking the right assets, picking the right locations, and particularly the right kind of properties, we'd certainly love to be part of that journey with you. So please reach out to our website, propertybuyer.com.au, and we'd love to chat with you. Jeremy, thank you once again. It's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you, Rich. Pleasure to chat with you today, mate. So please stay tuned for another edition of the Property Buyer Podcast. We'll be back in touch with you again in another two weeks time. Bye for now. Thanks for being with us on another Property Buyer Podcast. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please click on the SpeakPipe link and we'll answer this during the next episode. If you're looking to buy a residential or commercial property in the near future and would like to get the added advantage of having a buyer's advocate on your side, then please reach out to my team today and send us your inquiry and we'd be delighted to help. Please visit our website at propertybuyer.com.au where you can stay updated with all my latest market updates, weekly blogs and live suburb profiles to help you make better property decisions. We look forward to connecting with you again on the next Property Buyer podcast.